every craftsman needs their tools. And hey, we songwriters are no different. And the great news is we live in the world of 2021 now, where there are a bunch of tools that we can use to cheaply make music and to really equip ourselves to write the best music we possibly can, all with free tools that we have at our fingertips due to the internet. Let's talk about it. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of Songwriter Theory. I, as always, am your host, Joseph Vidala. And today we are going to talk about some tools to help you write songs in 2021. Before we dive in, the first essential thing that you need to write songs in 2021, you know what's coming. My free guide. 10 different ways to start writing a song. It's at songwritertheory.com slash free guide. It will give you five different ways to start writing a song from a lyrical perspective and five different ways to start writing a song from a musical perspective. Because, hey, it's easy to start writing some of the same sounding, less than interesting music. It's easy to start to lose inspiration when you always start writing a song the same way which for a lot of people is you grab your guitar, figure out a chord progression, and then you improvise, like humming your voice a melody, and then you write lyrics to it. All of a sudden, when all your songs start to sound a little similar, it shouldn't be that surprising because you're always writing in the same order, the same way, starting with the same instrument. And hey, that's why sometimes the pool of creativity will run dry. So a good way to avoid that, that free guide, songwritertheory.com slash free guide. Link will be in the description. So we're talking about tools today. And before we dive into what some of these tools are, I just want to give a little background. So at some point, right, CGI in movies would have been considered cheating, Right, because it was new to the art. Like, oh, real movie makers don't cheat by using CGI, right? Now CGI is everywhere. At some point, real animation was drawings, right? Now, due to Pixar, with, you know, their revolutionary Toy Story, which was all CGI, you know, computer animated. Now everything's computer animated, right? Even Disney, their movies are all animated on a computer now, right? So, and I talked about this last week, if you joined last week, but the NFL started doing instant replay in 76. Baseball didn't start doing it until 2008, right? Why? Like, it doesn't, it it makes the game more ethical when you make sure you get the call right, right? So what, what is this resistance to change, right? It's like people who seem to think that the only real writing is if you write by hand or with a typewriter, right? Like, that's ridiculous. Like, look, if that works for you, that's fine, right? But it's not cheating to write on a computer, right? There's a bunch of new technology that can help us do things better and faster. There's no cheating here, right? There's stealing, but there's no cheating. So it's kind of like, I don't know if you watch The Mandalorian, But regardless, what they did was basically invent this new thing. They call it the volume, okay? And basically what it is, is it uses VR technology where basically instead of being in front of a green screen, the actors are actually acting in an area where the screen actually shows their environment. So when Mando, Din Djarin, right, the main character, is walking on Tatooine, for instance. The actor doesn't see green all around him, and the they don't have to edit out later the green reflection on his shiny helmet, right? Literally, what he's seeing is more or less what we see. He sees in this giant dome of LCD screens, he sees Tatooine around him. So you know how much easier it is to act when you actually look like you're going into light speed, right? How much easier it is to act when you're looking with wonder at a giant creature that you actually see on the screen, right? Like this makes acting 
more easy to get right because you don't have to act as hard. You don't have to look at a green screen and pretend you see something you don't see. You can see it on the freaking screen. It also allows them to do less editing and post, right? It's, it's allowed them as well to now they don't have to go to some desert to film a scene that's on Tatooine, right? So Tatooine's a desert planet if you don't know much about Star Wars. So it makes the cost of making a high quality, amazing looking show go way down. So now they can give us more Star Wars shows that all look incredible without totally breaking the bank, which is awesome, right? That's something to be celebrated. And look, even if you're not a Star Wars fan, I'm sure that technology will be everywhere in 10 years, right? It helps make the art better. It makes it more cheap to do something more awesome. Why not use it? It's not cheating. So in the same way as songwriters, let's have the same attitude, right? There are a bunch of great tools out there for us to use. Let's not shy away from them. So let's talk about what they are. First, we have all the internet tools available to us. These are sort of on the songwriting side of things. Number one, I've talked about this a lot. Don't rely on yourself to figure out rhymes, right? That's how you end up with rhymes like light and night, right? Or me and see, right? The type of rhymes you hear a billion times, everybody's rolling their eyes about it. Your song feels predictable. It feels like it's just a cookie cutter combination of, of all the things that everyone's always heard before. That's how you end up there. So use rhymezone.com where you can type in a word and it will give you all the rhymes. It will give you the rhymes and then it will break it down by syllable, right? It will give you one syllable words that rhyme. It will give you two syllable words that rhyme with your word. It will give you three syllable words, right? All the way down. It will even give you compound words. It will even, there are like two different, I think like bolded versus not bolded text where one is like a more perfect rhyme, and then they also give you less than perfect rhymes, which I've talked about before being very useful, right? Sometimes less than perfect rhymes are actually a really good way to make the the rhyming not so just corny. So it can be really helpful to have not perfect rhymes, especially if you are rhyming a lot, right? If you're going A, B, A, B, and you're rhyming, like every line rhymes with another rhyme, with another line, uh, you know what I mean? Um, that can really start to be a bit much, especially if they're all perfect rhymes like night and light. So rhymezone.com, great tool. Another one, one of my personal favorites is thesaurus.com. So if you've ever gotten my six-step lyric writing checklist, one of the things I talk about in there, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite discoveries I've ever had in songwriting is what I call my iterative lyric writing process. I'll put a link to that. Uh, guide in the description as well. Um, but basically the idea behind it is you take the weakest part of your song or the weakest section of your song or the weakest word in a line, and then you keep changing it and you keep working at it until it becomes as good as it should be. And then you work on what is the new weakest part of your song. And then you keep, you know, and you're just concentrating on this one small part as far as like I've gone so far as and I often do. I'll concentrate on one word. Right. If if I don't if I think the word bad doesn't conjure what I want it to, I'll throw the word bad, for instance, in thesaurus.com. And now they're giving me all these more interesting versions of that word. Right. They're giving me all synonyms that don't mean exactly the same thing, or it's maybe just a better word, right? Like, for example, I did that with pain once, and I got ache. And in the context of that song, the word ache was a lot more visceral of a word and a lot more interesting and precise of a word than pain, right? Pain is kind of a neutral word, right? It's kind of like happy and sad, right? Happy and sad are, are meh. Like, what type of sad? Sad is like 50% of all moods fit somewhat under sad, right? So we want more precise words. We want more visceral words. We want words that that really make people feel emotions. And pain is just eh, kind of a neutral word, right? Which doesn't mean pain can't be a great word sometimes. But um, when you're looking to really up your word game, thesaurus.com, great tool. One that I actually just discovered here recently that I'm very excited about is relatedwords.org. Basically, you can give a word and it will give you a bunch of words that are really related to that word. So for instance, 
something that I recommend doing with your songs is actually doing something where you're sort of on this discovery journey, right? So in my six steps to lyric writing, one of the steps is the brainstorm sheet where I tell you to go find Google images that, that sort of conjure up the feelings that you want your song to have, right? So maybe if it's a breakup song to keep it simple, you know, you go find pictures of breakups or you search, I don't know, the term lonely and you find art that, that is all, you know, that, that shows somebody being lonely. Maybe they're alone on a park bench and that sort of gives you that, that feeling that you want the song to give stuff like that. So another good thing to do is to just go get a bunch of words that are all sort of in the area of what you want to talk about. So for instance, I have a song called um, The Wanderer that I'm working on. And the whole idea behind it is the idea of a person who's constantly wandering and, and constantly saying, if I have this, then I'll be happy, right? Oh, if I have this, then I'll be happy, right? And it's this this sort of dark story about always thinking, oh, it's the next thing that will make me feel fulfilled, but you never get there, right? And at some point, it should become obvious to the listener, oh, I see where this is going. So it feels inevitable and yet right, right? That the person never finds that happiness. So it's, it's sort of a story about that. And the imagery I want to use is a wanderer, somebody, you know, sort of wandering from town to town through the mountains or, or you know, on, on beaten paths, right? So for some reason, this this looks a little like Middle Earth to me in my brain, right? So I went on, or I found really, relatedwords.org, and then I type in something, for example, like mountain, and then it will give me a bunch of words that are sort of like mountain, right? But, or are related to mountain, right? Like mountain forest, mountain peak, right? So it'll give me a bunch of words that I can then use for my song to sort of make this world really feel like, yes, we're in this mountainous area with peak. Cause I'm using all words that sound like a wanderer going through the forest, um, going from small town to small town, climbing mountains and stuff like that. Right. And cliffs and you know, whatever the other terminology is, I'm doing a similar thing for a song called, uh, here until you leave, uh, where the main imagery is sort of two people, looking, um, basically two people on a beach and the, the real basics of it is you in your faithful gaze are looking at your significant other, but they're looking off at the sunset, thinking about the future without you. That's way oversimplified. There's a lot more to it, but for the sake of it. So anyway, the imagery is on a beach. So I searched beach, right? So different things come up like shell, coastline, boardwalk, right? Boardwalk's not something I might've thought of, even though it's really obvious now, right? Like, oh, boardwalk and beach. Yeah, those things go together. Um, you know, and lighthouse, right? Like lighthouse is another thing that that I, I put in there. And that gives me a bunch of different word options. So it really helps to create a world using with your word selection in a song that really feels cohesive and like one true wor world, right? When you're talking about the beach and you're talking about sand and you're talking about a boardwalk and you're talking about cliffs, right? And you're talking about, you know, seashells and some of these are obvious, right? But, but some might be less so like the boardwalk thing, which is the main one I remember for whatever reason. But point is, if you want to do that sort of thing, relatedwords.org, Google image search alluded to it before, right? Big fan of when you're first starting to write a song, go find pictures, art that conveys the feelings or the story that you want your song to so that as you're writing your song, you can look at these images and, and, you know, images are worth a thousand words as they say, right? So, and images should be, these images you find should give you an emotional response that will make it easier for you to tap into the emotions you need to tap into, to really write a genuine, real song about these emotions that you might not always feel right. So, you know, maybe if it's a breakup song and you've been happily married for a while, right? So I would know about that, um, but you're still writing some sad songs and stuff like that. It can be really helpful to have images that bring you back to some of those feelings and remind yourself what it felt like, 
you know, to feel alone or something like that. If you're not dealing with that anymore. So Google image search, huge, huge help. And then Google drive. Look, I'm, I'm Google may or may not be evil, which I know is crazy to say here on YouTube, which is owned by Google. Um, but Hey, for now, at least, it's helpful. A Google Drive is amazing. You can have access to your files from anywhere. You can organize things so nicely into folders that you can access and 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 you know edit on your phone, no matter what type of phone you use, right? Unlike iCloud, for example, where it's going to be a pain in the butt to access if you're on something that's not a Mac, because screw Apple. But, um, you know, or unlike even a Microsoft thing, right? Where like maybe if you have an iPhone, the, you know, Microsoft Word on an iPhone just feels wrong, right? But but for Google, Google is really meant to work on all platforms. So this, and, and honestly, Word has a bunch of powerful stuff that you're never going to use, right? You're just writing songs. It's not a big deal. So Google Drive is another thing. Look, if you want to be a person who writes songs physically with your hand on a notepad or piece of paper... That's fine, but don't lose it, right? Maybe write it on your piece of paper, and then after you're done for your songwriting session for the day, then transfer to Google Drive, right? Or even take a picture of it and put the picture on Google Drive, right? Because even then, you're not losing it. And that's sort of the point of Google Drive here is, look, never put yourself in a position. I've lost a songwriting journal before. It's kind of devastating. (laughs) I mean, this is way back when I was like in high school and such a terrible songwriter that now I am very okay with the fact that those songs are lost. Um, Because when I do find those notebooks now, it's really depressing. Like, oh, wow. I like, of course I was bad. I was in high school, right? Like everybody's a bad songwriter in high school. But man, just burn those. Please, please do me a favor. Um, So Google Drive, right? Don't allow yourself to lose inspiration, to lose things. And then the other side is recording gear. And I'll have links below, um, especially if you're on YouTube, for some of my recommendations specifically, in case you do want specific recommendations. But generally speaking, here's a list of things that you need. Okay? Number one. You need DAW or DAW software. This is a software that allows you to record. You can get something like Audacity, which is free. Um, I believe it's free. You can use GarageBand if you want. That comes free on your Mac if you have a Mac. Or you can use Reaper, which you can download for free and use for free for infinite amount of time, uh, which I know because I used it for free for like seven years, recorded a full length album on it, released that album, et cetera. Uh, before I was like, wait, I'm kind of a terrible person for having not bought it. The license is 60 bucks, 60 bucks for a fully professional DAW or DAW software. Um, so as far as your computer is concerned, right, that's what you need in order to record your music into your computer and do mixing and all that kind of stuff too. So that's number one Reaper, 60 bucks. Just buy it right away. It's great. Um, but again, you can download it and the it it gives you full functionality for free. It really does. It will just bother you for five seconds every time you open it until you buy it. Um, but it's not a big deal. I ignored it for years. Um, but don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be me. I should have bought it sooner. I'm sorry, Reaper. You make great stuff. It's good stuff. And I'm happy that I bought it from you. So... Next thing is audio interface, right? Some people call this an external sound card, but it's a little misleading, right? So an audio interface is basically the little box that you plug your XLR cables into, right? Which are basically microphone cables or your quarter inch jacks, right? Which is basically your guitar cables or your MIDI cables, right? Which is for stuff like keyboards into this box that then goes into your computer via USB, right? So it's basically for taking your musical instruments, your microphones, your electric guitar signal, right? Or bass guitar signal. And then converting it into something that then can be sent via USB so that your DAW can record it, right? So we see where we're at here. So then from there, what do you think you need? An XLR cable, right? You need your XLR cable. 
that you can plug into your microphone, right? And by the way, you can get a really good audio interface for about a hundred bucks. So we're looking at a hundred, a hundred bucks so far, right? You can get Reaper for free. So a hundred bucks so far. XLR cable, you can get a pretty good one from Amazon, like Amazon Basics. They have solid XLR cables. I have gotten multiple of them, I'm pretty sure. Um, maybe just one, but I think I've gotten multiple. Eight to 12 bucks. Simple. Get like a six footer. Call it a day, right? Now you need to be able to plug that XLR cable into a microphone. You can get a large diaphragm condenser microphone that's pretty solid for like 50 bucks or 100 bucks. So we're talking about like not even 200 bucks so far. And you have all the things you need except for a mic stand, which is going to be useful, right? You can get a mic stand like this that I use. I wouldn't recommend this for... Um, for most recording, right? Because it's, it's it's on my desk and it's 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 sort of meant for more of a podcasting sort of thing. But you can get a solid mic stand again from Amazon for like twenty five bucks or maybe fifty bucks if you want to get a little nicer one. Uh, pop filter, right? This is basically so that. Forgive me, but I'll give an example. If I go, that probably was not very comfortable, right? That's without a pop filter. That is with a pop filter. Hopefully that actually came through and made a difference. But the point is pop filters make it so that your P's and what are called plosives don't sound like crap and ruin your recording. 10 bucks will make your recordings a lot better. Just get one. Um, and then headphones, right? Because while podcasting, I don't need this, right? Because I'm just talking. But if I'm list, you know, in order for me to record my vocals for my song, I need to know where in the song I am and I need to be able to hear the song. But I also don't want it to be playing through speakers so that it bleeds back into the mic. Right. So that's what headphones are for. Headphones, you can mix using headphones. Right. You don't really need monitors. Yes, you can get them. Yes, they're helpful. I have them. I like using headphones and external monitors. They're both helpful. But hey, when you're starting out, just get a solid set of like $50 headphones. Just make sure that they are flat frequency response. Flat, because you don't want, you know, don't use beat headphones where they glorify the bass, right? You want to hear exactly what the song sounds like. You want an accurate representation of what the song sounds like as you're listening to it, as you're recording it, as you're mixing it. And then... You know, so we're looking at like 300 bucks for all this stuff. And that's all the stuff you need. Again, I'll have recommendations down below that are more or less around those price points. Um, But, you know, if you want to go the extra mile, then get a keyboard or a MIDI controller, right? This is like a $300 fully weighted. I say this, you can't see it even on video, Um, but it's a Yamaha keyboard. It's like 300, 400 bucks, fully weighted keys, 88 keys. So it's a full pianist's keyboard for like three, 400 bucks. You don't need that. You can get a synth for like 50 or a hundred bucks that only has like an octave or whatever. That's totally fine for a lot of people's purposes. But if you're a pianist like me, I recommend if, Hey, you might, you, you probably already have one of these, right? And you probably just never knew what those weird cable plug-in things that you never use on the side are. Well, those are probably MIDI cable out and in ports. So now all you need is a mini cable, which is like eight bucks on Amazon, eight, 10 bucks maybe. And then you can plug that into your audio interface. And that's how you can record piano and keyboard parts and synth parts and all the different things that you can. I mean, that's basically if you're making electronic music without vocals, all you need is a keyboard, a mini cable, and then Uh, really you don't even need a full audio interface at that point because there are definitely things that go straight from MIDI to USB. Um, But that's a whole other thing. The point is, look, 21st century for 500 bucks or less, 300 bucks, you can have a really nice studio equipment to record solid sounding music at home. And if you want to learn how to do that, look, I talk about songwriting here, okay? So I'm not... I'm not going to get into how to mix a song and stuff like that. Uh, But a great resource, the best resource, in my opinion, that I highly recommend. I've been following him since like day one is Graham Cochran over at the Recording Revolution. Go check him out. He will teach you how to 
record, mix, master songs at home. He's big into the whole, like, like, I think he has a free guide on like, you know, build a, I think he has like a build a, a home studio for 200 bucks type thing. Dude crushes it. Recording revolution. It's awesome. Go check out his stuff. If you want to learn more about like actually how to record and that sort of stuff, we're going to keep talking about song, the songwriting side of things here, but go check that out if you are interested in that. But look, For 300, 500 bucks, you can have an awesome studio at home. You can record these songs that you're writing. You can use recording as a supplemental tool to your songwriting, right? Because ever since I've started like combining the process of recording music and songwriting, I've gotten a lot more creative because I have more sounds at my fingertips, right? I have more than just my piano and my acoustic guitar. Now I have all these synths at my fingertips that I can just record right away and then keep them there, and then use that sound to inspire the rest of the song that I write. It's really, really awesome. So I highly recommend using all of these tools that the 21st century brings us. It's 2021. Use the tools that are available to us. Let me know if this was helpful to you. If you're on YouTube, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Let me know Um, if you plan on going out and buying some equipment, you're going to start recording. Let me know of those websites I mentioned, rhymezone.com, thesaurus.com, Google, or, uh, relatedwords.org, Google image search, right? Let me know, let me know which of those are most helpful to you. Go check those out. Let me know what you think. Drop a like if you enjoyed this video and you're on YouTube. If you're listening via podcast, well, you know what to do. Go leave that iTunes review. I appreciate all of you who have taken the time to do that. That's really awesome. I cannot thank you enough. I appreciate all of you for all the listens that you may have given me this past year, all the amount of time that you're willing to spend with me talking about songwriting and the fact that you're willing to learn about songwriting and dedicate yourself to this really, really awesome craft that, of course, I am biased towards, but I think is one of the most powerful things in the world. If there's anything else in the world that after four minutes you can like change somebody's life, you can change their mind about, I don't know, committing suicide or, you know, really lift somebody up within four minutes out of a horrible mood and really be in a great mood. Music, man, music's the way to do that. So I think it's a really high calling being a songwriter. So the fact that you are willing to listen to videos and podcasts about this says a lot about you. um, And I think that's really awesome. So if nobody else is going to say, hey, thanks for dedicating yourself to a really honorable craft, which, yes, can also be very selfish. Admittedly, a lot of songs are sort of, you know, double use, right? Like it's self-therapy and hopefully it also helps somebody else. But um, I still think it's a high calling, right? We are little C creators uh, compared to the big C creator. So doing creative things I think is a really high calling regardless of what creative venture it is, but songwriting, of course, especially in my heart. So if nobody else will say thank you for being willing to take the time to learn the craft of songwriting and do songwriting, I will. So thank you. You are awesome for doing this. And I look forward to talking to you next time.